Hello, it's nice to have each of you here with us this morning as we continue in our study of the book of Jeremiah. And uh, if you've got your if you've got your Bible handy, if you would turn to Jeremiah chapter 36, uh, starting in verse 1, we'll begin there in just a moment. Uh, let's start first with a word of prayer. Father, we praise your holy name. We, we thank you for this opportunity to be here uh, this morning, uh, to come together, to open your word together. Lord, we ask that you would guide our hearts as we look at this passage. Lord, it, it is it is difficult to imagine being in this type of a situation as Jeremiah finds himself in uh, in that day. Uh, Lord, it, as a faithful believer, Lord, we, we have to understand that we should be true and faithful to your will in all things, Lord, no matter what those may be, Lord, that your will is what is perfect and what is best. And, and Lord, we under, have to understand that we have we should comply and we should follow your will. Lord, we have to understand this in all things. And, and Lord, help us and as we go through life to, to take the, the very good, the blessings that you give us, Lord, with the very the difficult things that we we find in this lost and dying world and, and to live with those things and to understand that lord we serve you and we live following you in your will lord god our hearts now it's in the name of our lord and savior jesus that we pray amen as jeremiah set imprisoned by King Zedekiah, while the Babylonian armies held the capital city of Jerusalem under siege, he had much time to pray and to think about how his nation of Judah came to this place where they found themselves. In this chapter, like chapter 35, Jeremiah looks back several years earlier, just after the first of the three deportations of Jews to Babylon had occurred in 605 BC, when the prophet Daniel and several hundred others had been taken captive into Babylon. So now as we come to chapter 36, starting in verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll of a book and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations. From the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah, even to this day. The command to Jeremiah from the Lord was to take, take a scroll of a book and write on it a, a record in one volume of all the messages between the outset of Jeremiah's ministry and approximately 627 B.C., as we see it start in Chapter, ver, chapter 1, verse number 2 of this very book, up to 605-604 B.C., okay, about the time that, that Jeremiah is starting here, the fourth year of Jer Jehoiakim, God commanded that this scroll of a book be read to the people in the temple as a record of all the words that God had spoken to them to through Jeremiah to Israel against Judah and against all the nations. Okay, so let's go, let's go down to verse three. And it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the adversaries which I 
advert, I'm sorry, will hear all the adversities which I purpose to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, especially as we go into his next book, because he mourned over, over the sinful state of his nation, Judah, and the destruction which God had brought upon his nation because they refused to repent. In this previous time, Jeremiah had also been imprisoned by Jehoiakim for this strong preaching which called for repentance or facing God's punishment. The Lord knew that Jeremiah would be finally released from prison on certain conditions. Okay, so God commissioned Jeremiah again to write down the past 20 years worth of the words God had given him for the beginning of his ministry. God gave the, his written word through Jeremiah for two reasons. Number one, so that the people would know the imminent terrible consequences of their unrepented sins. And number two, so the people would turn from their sins so that God would forgive them and they would avoid God's judgment. That's what we saw in verses one and two. Okay, so now let's come down to verse four. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll of a book at the instruction of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken to him. Baruch was Jeremiah's recording secretary. Let's come down to verses five and six. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am confined. I cannot go into the house of the Lord or the temple. You go, therefore, and read from the scroll which you have written at my instruction, the words of the Lord in the hearing of the people in the Lord's house on the day of fasting. And you shall also read them in the hearing of all Judah who came from their cities on the day of fasting so that there would be many people there to hear it. Jeremiah said, I am confined. Now, there's no definite record of Jeremiah being imprisoned under Jehoiakim, but apparently there was some period where he was. But we see here that Jeremiah had be re been released from this confinement, but with restrictions. And he was forbidden from going into the temple. Jeremiah commanded Baruch, to take these writings that God had commanded him to put together in this scroll and take it into the hearing of the people on a day of fasting. And there were many people there and read it. Okay, now verse seven. It may be that they will present their supplication before the Lord and everyone will turn from his evil way for great is the anger and the fury that the Lord has pronounced against the people. Okay, they had already read written these things down. So they knew the anger and fury that was in those writings. Verse nine. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem. Okay, so there was a special, there was a special proclamation of a fast. This implies that it took some part of a year to repeat and record the long series of messages so that was given by Jeremiah. And the ninth month was November, December time frame, and they proclaimed a fast before the Lord of all the people. Okay, verse 10. Then Baruch read from the book of the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chamber of Jemariah, the son of Shaphan the scribe, in the upper court. Okay, so it was in a, a place where they could open a window that was above the main, one of the main courtyards of the temple. Okay, so he could read and everybody could down below could hear. Okay at the entry gate of the Lord's house. So it was a place where there were a large number of the people all gathered together as they came into the temple. Okay. 
And, the, and so they all would be able to hear. Verses 11 and 12. When Micaiah, Micaiah, the son of Jamaria, the son of Shaphan, heard all the words of the Lord from the book, he then went down to the king's house into the scribe's chamber where, where all the princes were setting. Elishama, the scribe, and Deliah, the son of Shemaiah, Elnathan, the son of Akbor, Gamaria, the son of Shaphan, and Zedekiah, the son of Haniah, and all of the princes. Okay, we'll stop there. An official of the king named Micaiah heard the words of the Lord and went down to the king's house and shared the words of the Lord with all the princes. Okay, that's the bottom line there. A lot of people are mentioned here. A lot of the scribes, okay, that were in the temple, they're about scrolls and written books, okay? They are the ones that have to lend their authority to the truthfulness of what's written in those types of things. So they come together whenever there's a scroll or something that's written or read. Okay, so 14 through 15. Therefore, all the princes sent Jehudi, the son of Nathaniah, the son of Shalemiah, the son of Cushi, to Barak, Baruch, I'm sorry, Baruch, saying, take in your hand the scroll from which you have read in the hearing of the people and come. So Baruch, the son of Nerea, took the scroll in his hand and came to them. And he said to him, sit down now and read it in your reading. So Baruch read it in their hearing in front of the princes. Okay, now verses 16 through 18. Now it happened when they had heard all the words that they looked in fear to one another and said to Baruch, we sure we will surely tell the king of all these words. Now note a word there. You see that word fear. Okay. They when they had heard all these words, they looked in fear from one another. Okay. That word fear, can, that Hebrew word is translated fear, can be translated terror. Okay for God's word, or for what the king might do, okay? If, if they thought this was God's word, if this was truth that they were reading from God, then they were afraid of God. If they were, if they, if they didn't think it was the words of God, then they were afraid of what the king was going to do when he heard these threats that were coming from Jeremiah and Baruch. So all the princes decided unanimously that they should surely tell the king of these words, though some may have wanted to tell him for one reason and others may have wanted to tell him for another reason. But they forewarned Baruch, knowing that he would tell Jeremiah. Okay, let's come down to verse 19. Then the princes said to Baruch, go and hide you and Jeremiah and let no one know where you are. Now, that means that they there were some number of them that were pretty positive that the king was not going to be happy with what he heard and were going to come looking for Baruch and Jeremiah to do them harm. After all, Jeremiah had just gotten out of jail. Okay, so now we come down to verse 20. Okay, verse 20. And they went to the king into the court, but they stored the scroll in the chamber of Elishama, the scribe, and told all the words in the hearing of the king. Now the princes went to the king into his court, but they stored the scroll back in the temple in the chamber of Elishama, the scribe. Now they went and took, they went to speak to the king but they didn't take the scroll with them, okay? So they didn't want to be the ones that were actually carrying that scroll when they walked in. You, you've, you've heard about killing the messenger, okay? 
They didn't want to be the one carrying that scroll when the king saw him walk in there as being the one who's going to deliver the bad news. So they left it in the temple, all right? And they went in and just told him what this thing kind of said, okay? To see how he reacted to it, okay? The court refers to a place or a meeting area where the inside the palace where the king might entertain a large group of people. We do not know exactly how large this delegation from the temple was and of exactly who the princes are. We're given a large list of names in, in verse 19 with some in, in verses 10 through 12, actually, we're given a large list of names we read just a moment ago. Uh, the collective group recounted for Jehoiakim the, ten, the details that led them to request a meeting by telling all the words in the hearing of the king. And in other words, they were kind of each recalling different aspects of what was in that long scroll. Remember, it was everything that he had written over about 20 years and given to the people of Judah. So it was a lot. It was a long scroll, okay, about everything that we have in the book of Jeremiah up to this point. Okay, now verse 21. So the king sent to Jehudi to bring the, skull, the scroll, and he brought it to Elisha, Elisha Ma, Elisha Ma is probably a better pronunciation, the, scri the scribe's chamber. And Yehudi read it in the hearing of the king and in the hearing of all the princes who stood beside the king. Okay. So the king, the Jehoiakim's response, Yehudi took the scroll from Elisha, the scribes in the scribes' chamber. Okay. Yehudi read it in the hearing of the king and in the hearing of the princes. He's the one that read, he took it from the scribes' chamber in the temple, and he also read it to the king. All right. Jehoiakim's response was vital and pivotal. Okay, that's important for us to understand because support for Jeremiah's words could turn the country back toward the Lord, just as King Josiah's support, who was, by the way, Jehoiakim's father, just as his support had turned Judah back to the Lord after the book of the law had been found in the temple and read to him in 2 Kings chapter 22. That can happen through preaching, teaching, or even simple conversations in our day as well. We should be careful and quick to tell people the truth of God's word. Whether we think it's going to be accepted or not, we should be faithful to speak the truth in love according to God's word. Because sometimes it will make all the difference in the world for the good. We might think it will be bad, but sometimes it can be very good. Let's go down to verses 22 and 23. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with a fire burning on the hearth before him. And it happened when Jehudi had read three or four columns that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the scroll was consumed. In the fire that was on the hearth. The ninth month in the Jewish calendar, as we said a while ago, is Kislev. Kislev, Kislev, which falls in November, December time frame. The Hebrew term slant, translated winter house comes from a word refers to the fall harvest. Once fall harvest concluded in Israel, temperatures would normally begin to drop across the land pretty quickly. The cooler temperatures are noted in the observation that Jehoiakim set with a fire burning on the hearth before him. Okay. 
Whoops. I don't think I want to go there yet. A second. Let's go back. If I can get the page turned. There we go. Jehoiakim responded with a total contempt for God's prophet Jeremiah and therefore God's word also. And it happened when Jehu Jehudi had read three or four columns that the king would cut with the scribe's knife and cast that whole section of that page into the fire. And the Hebrew wording describes a harsh throwing or flinging, with fling it into the fire. It is used elsewhere, this, this flinging as a lion throwing down its victim's body on the ground to eat it. In 1 Kings 13, 24 through 25, his disrespect for God's word is a sharp contrast to the profound respect of his father, Josiah, that we saw in 2 Kings 22, such that all of the scroll that Jehudi read was consumed by the fire that was on the hearth. The entire scroll was burned to ashes. So we come to verse 24, where we read, yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments, the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words. The king's defiant actions caused no visible concern among his council. They were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments i.e. the king's princes and his servants were hardened to God's word as well. The Hebrew word translated afraid is that same one that was back in verse 16 that I'd showed you earlier. It can be translated out of the Hebrew either afraid or terrified, where it describes the other temple officials' reverent respect for God's word. Here it defies that nobody respected God's word in this manner. For those who heard all these words, the Apostle Paul writes of those who have heard God's word but have no respect for it in Romans 2, 5. Here's what Paul says to a person who has no respect for God's word. But in accordance with your hardness, in your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. If you think about it, that will take your breath away. Let's go to verses 25 and 26. Nevertheless, El Nathan. Deliah and Gamariah implored the king not to burn the scroll. When he first started to cut a piece off and throw it in the fire, they implored him not to do that. But he would not listen to them. And the king commanded Jeremiel, the king's son, and Sarah the son of Azrael, and Shalamiah, the son of Abiel. Those, when, he, when he has... Another son there. These are all the son of, Je of, of the king, okay? But the second name is their mother, okay? And he commanded these th three of his sons to seize Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet. But God had already hidden them. They had been advised to hide, but God and God hid them. He covered them so that they could not be found. Now, we see three of these officials, El Nathan, Deleiah, and Gamariah, who tried to intervene. These three men were court attendants listed in verses 11 and 12, along with the others with the princes who heard the reading of the scroll. They were obviously moved by the writings of the scroll. And remember the, that word fear in verse 16 they were fearing these words as being the word of God, likely. And they were the one, therefore, when he started to burn them, they were afraid of God's wrath. Okay. So for at least three, they were really afraid of burning this scroll. 
Okay. In verse 26, then the king commanded these sons to, to find Baruch and Jeremiah, likely have them killed or imprisoned. Uh, some people will reject God's word and some will try to silence. The Bible challenges people to admit they're sinners. And most people in this world just don't want to do that. Consequently, they invest a lot of time and energy in discrediting the Bible and God's messengers along with it, even in some cases to the point of killing them. This is the world we live in. It's a lost and dying world. Let's come down to the next chapter, next section in verses 27 through 28. Now, after the king had burned the scroll with the words which Baruch had written at the instruction of Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, take yet another scroll and write on it and at the former word, write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, has burned. Now, after the king burned the scroll, Jeremiah and Baruch could have fallen into deep despair. Jeremiah had prophesied for 20 years already and seen very little spiritual response. Then the king had sent his comprehensive record of God's messages up in flames. Even worse, Jeremiah knew that if Jehoiakim persisted in leading the nation into evil, only God's judgment was remaining to happen. The expression, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, stresses that the message the prophet proclaimed did not originate with him. It came from God. Jeremiah merely functioned as the messenger for what God wanted to say. The book of Jeremiah includes this its expression time and time and time again. What Jeremiah said was not popular in his day. God directed Jeremiah in verse 28 to take yet another scroll and begin the entire process all over again. God commanded that he write all the former words that were in the first scroll on this one, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned, but which the almighty God was determined to show Jehoiakim and all of Judah and future generations that this word would never be destroyed. Over 600 years after that, Jesus the Christ will say in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one little tittle but will by any means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Verse 29. And you say, and you shall say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, thus says the Lord, you have burned this scroll again. Yes, burn this scroll saying, why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will surely come and destroy this land and cause this man and beast to cease from here? God told Jeremiah. Now see, Jeremiah wasn't there when he was burning the scroll, but God told him these things about what went on while that, that Jeremiah didn't even see or hear. God told Jeremiah, you shall say to Jer Jer Jehoiakim, king of Judah, the king's action would have severe repercussions. Je Jehoiakim had opposed God's prophet and had publicly treated God's word with utmost contempt. The words, thus says the Lord, emphasize the divine origin of Jeremiah's words. Jeremiah, as a prophet of God, functioned as a spokesperson for God, and he spoke 
And what he spoke was the very words of God. Jehoiakim had not merely rejected Jeremiah, he had rejected God himself. The word, the Lord also affirmed that he had been watching as Je Jehoiakim burned this scroll and he had been listening as Jehoiakim defiantly questioned, why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land and cause man and beast to cease from here? Babylon's victory would mean Judah's defeat, and Judah's defeat would mean Jehoiakim's loss of power, or worse yet, his own execution at the orders of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Jehoiakim wanted no part of such a proclamation and thought that by burning the scroll by his own power, he would make the proclamation silently pass away. Does this sound familiar? This is called cancel culture. Yes, I said it. This is cancel culture. We if we don't like it, we're just gonna we're just gonna nullify it. Well, you know what? You can't do that. You've got to admit your faults and you have to change things. God will make sure you do. And if not, he'll tell you. In verse 30. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah. He shall have no one to sit on the throne of David. And his dead body shall be cast out into the heat of the day and the frost of the night. Verse 30. Therefore, dramatically in introduces the Lord's pronouncement of his verdict against Jehoiakim, king of Judah, which has two parts. Number one, Jehoiakim would have no one to set on the throne of David. Jehoiakim would die near the end of the first Babylonian siege against Jerusalem in 598 BC, and his son, Jehoiachin, who, are, who is sometimes called Jeconiah would reign only three months before surrendering to Nebuchadnezzar. He would be dethroned by Nebuchadnezzar and replaced by his uncle Zedekiah. Jehoiachin or Jeconiah was ta then taken captive to Babylon as a part of the second great deportation of Jews, which included Ezekiel. Number two, Nebuchadnezzar would have Jehoiakim's dead body cast into the Hinnom Valley south of Jerusalem, exposing it to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. As we see documented in 2 Chronicles 16, 14, and 20, verse 1. And verse 31. God says, I will punish him, his family, and his servants for their iniquity. And I will bring on them, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and on the men of Judah, all the doom that I have pronounced against them, but they did not heed. The Lord promised to punish Jehoiakim along with his descendants and his servants for their iniquity. God had also warned that he would send doom or disaster on the inhabitants of Jerusalem and on the men of Judah. Again, God's judgment progressed from the leaders to the residents of the capital and the general to the to the general population. The Lord had repeatedly warned them about the coming doom or disaster for 20 years through Jeremiah. Tragically, they did not heed as it's translated in the New King James, or listen, as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible, to God's words through his prophets. The nation as a whole, therefore, paid a terrible price in unwillingness to repent, as will the United States of America, if we will not listen to the Lord and his 
prophets. As they, as they speak to him from his word, if they will not listen and repent, we face the same punishment from God. It would not be fair if he will ignore our repentance as well. Verse 32, then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, and wrote on it and the instruction of Jeremiah and all the words of the book, which Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And besides, there was added to many of them many similar words. All right, now we come down to chapter 37. Now, King Zedekiah, now we're, okay, now we're coming back to where Jeremiah was, he was thinking back and contemplating these times that were many years before, okay, and what had happened under Jehoiakim. Now he's coming back to the present, and he is setting, he is setting under the reign of Zedekiah. So now, in verse 1, we read, now King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Oniah, the son of Jehoiakim, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had made king of the land of Judah. Zedekiah was an uncle of Jeconiah and was raised on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar, I'm sorry, was put on the throne by Je Nebuchadnezzar in contempt for Jehoiakim and Jeconiah. His 11-year reign was from 587 to 5, 597, I'm sorry, to 586 BC. The message of the king to Jeremiah in this chapter is somewhat earlier than in chapter 21, when Zedekiah was afraid of the Chaldeans defeating Egypt and returning to besiege Jerusalem. Okay, so this is this is a little bit earlier than chapter 21 that we looked at last week. So let's just let's just look at verse two and three now. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land gave heed to the words of the Lord, which he spoke by the prophet Jeremiah. And Zedekiah, the, ki the king, sent Jehuchal, the son of Shalamiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Maaseah, the priest, to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Pray now to the Lord for our God for us. Okay, verse 4. Now Jeremiah was coming and going along among the people, for they had not yet put him in prison. Okay. Then Pharaoh's army, verse 5, then Pharaoh's army came up from Egypt when the Chaldeans were besieging Jerusalem, heard the news of them, they departed from Jerusalem. Okay, so the, the Chaldeans had Jerusalem surrounded, but then when the Egyptians began to come up on their flank. They had to pull their army away, go and defeat the Egyptians, and then come back. Okay, so we come down to verse 7 and 8. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Thus you shall say to the king of Judah, who sent you to me to inquire of me, Behold, the Pharaoh's army, which has come up to help you, will return to Egypt to their own land. And the Chaldeans will come back and fight against this city and take it and burn it with fire. Okay. Okay. The Lord gives Jeremiah says, go tell the king this. Okay. He said, the king wants you to pray for him, but tell him this. The Egyptians are not going to win that battle. In fact, they're going to run back home with their tail between their legs from the Babylonians. And then the Babylonians are going to come back here and they're going to fight against this city and they are going to take it with fire. That's pretty scary stuff, huh? And we'll, let's come down to verses 11 and 12. And it happened when the army of the Chaldeans left the siege of Jerusalem for fear of Pharaoh's army, that Jeremiah went out of Jerusalem to go into the land of, ben of Benjamin to claim his property there among the people. Okay, remember, God had told Jeremiah to buy a deed to some property in the tribe inside the tribe of Gen Benjamin, and he did that. Okay, he was going to go out and take a look at the landy bond. Okay, while the while the 
Babylonians are away, he's going to go look at it. Okay, it's probably going to be his last chance to do that. So he was going to go do it. Well, verse 13, and when he was in the gate of Benjamin, okay, going out the, the, the gate of Jerusalem, which is the one that goes straight over into Benjamin, a captain of the guard was there whose name was Urijah, Uri, the son of Shalemiah, the son of Hananiah. He sees Je Jeremiah the prophet saying, you are defecting to the Chaldeans. Then Jeremiah said, false, I am not defecting to the Chaldeans. But he did not listen to him. So Urijah seized Jeremiah and brought him to the princes. Verse 15, therefore the princes were angry with Jeremiah and they struck him and put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe for they had made the house of Jonathan the scribe a prison. All right. When Jeremiah entered the dungeon and the cells and, Je and Jeremiah had remained there for many days, then Zedekiah the king sent and, and took him out. The king asked him secretly in his house and said, is there any word from the Lord? And Jeremiah said, there is. And then he said, you shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. Well, there was, a, there was some discussion with Zedekiah. He didn't like that answer. But the bottom line is, then get Zedekiah the king commanded that they should commit Jeremiah to the court of the prison. Okay, you can imprison him, but imprison him here in my court. And that they should give him daily a piece of bread from the baker's street until all the bread in the city was gone. Thus, Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So this is where he was in prison when he was thinking about what we studied, what we were looking at in the previous chapter. Okay. So now we come to chapter 38. Now some time has passed. And now Shep Atiyah, the son of Maton, Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, Jukal, the son of Shalem, Shalemiah, and Pasher, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken to all the people saying, Thus says the Lord, he who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes over to the Chaldeans shall live. His life shall be, be as a prize to him and he shall live. Thus says the Lord, the city shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which he sh which shall take it. Okay. In other words, Jeremiah tells the people in Jerusalem, if you'll go surrender to the Chaldeans, you'll live. If not, you're going to die, most likely. So they took Jeremiah and they cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the prison. And they let Jeremiah down into with ropes. And in the dungeon, there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sank into the mire or the or the very wet mud, okay, so that he was stuck in it. He couldn't get his legs even pulled out of it, okay? And uh and the and the king realized he was told the king was told that they had thrown him into this mire, okay? And and they said to the king in verses seven, eight, and nine that if you don't get him out of there, he's going to die. This is going to take him long to die. At all. They're not giving him any food or water. There's no water down there, and he's going to die in just a few hours if you don't get him out of there. Okay, so we so we come down to verse 10. It says, then the, the king commanded, now remember this name, Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian. Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian. Take from here 30 men with you and left lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. Okay, so this this Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, under the, in, under the direction of the king, takes 30 men and gets Jeremiah out of this dungeon and saves his life. Okay, verse 13. So they pulled Jeremiah up 
with the ropes and lifted him out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So let's come down to verse 14, 17 now. It says, Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then your soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. Note two words there. He says, your soul shall live, okay, and your house shall live, if you will go ahead and surrender to Babylon's princes, rather than wait for the house, the whole city to, to run out of food, and to and to fall if you'll surrender babylon's princes your soul shall live and your house shall live okay so mark those words okay but if you do not surrender to the king of babylon's princes then this shit city shall be given to the hand of the chaldeans they shall burn it with fire and you shall not escape from their hands Verse 24, then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, let no one know of these words and you shall not die. In other words, Zedekiah says, if you tell anybody this, else this, I'm going to have you killed. Okay. Just as simple as that. Verse 28. Now Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken. And he was there when Jerusalem was taken. Okay. So so this is this is the state he was in. When he was when he was talking about verse chapter thirty six that we started off with, okay, and thinking back, he had a lot of time to think. Okay, this it was better part of two years when he was we were wait, waiting out this siege. Okay, now verses two and three in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day, the city was penetrated. Then all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. These are names, they were Babylonian, Babylonian names that are difficult to pronounce. Pardon me. Nergal, Sharizer, Sama, Samgar, Nebo, Sarsekim, Rabarsis, Nergal, Sarizer. Ragmad and the rest of the princes of the king of Babylon. Okay. They all sat in the gate and they're pronouncing judgment on everybody that's they're pulling that's being pulled out of the city. All the Jews that are being taken out of the Jew out of the city are being judged by these these men. So it was that when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and all the men of war saw them, that they fled and they went out of the city by night by way of the king's garden by the gate between the two walls. And they went out by way of the plain. So Zedekiah and all the soldiers found a way out of the city and tried to escape. But the Chaldean army pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. So they got all the way down the long, narrow, winding switchback road to Jericho, and they got caught in the plains of Jericho. And then, and when they had captured him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah in the land of Hamath, and there he pronounced judgment on him. And that's where Nebuchadnezzar judged him. Remember, Jeremiah kept prophesying and telling Zedekiah, you're going to stand and you're going to look Nebuchadnezzar right in the eyes and he is going to pronounce judgment on you. That's what's going to happen. That's what God had said all along. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes in Riblon. The king of Babylon also killed all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with bronze fetters and carried him off to Babylon. But he lived, just like Jeremiah, Jeremiah said. Okay, so killing his soul was blinding him 
losing his his family or his lineage was killing all of his sons. Okay, so Jeremiah said, if you'll give yourself up to the nobles now, they won't do that to you. But if you make them wait until they've defeated your city, they're going to kill your sons and they're going to put your eyes out. And they and this happened just like Jeremiah said. He said, you got a choice. But Zedekiah said, if you tell anybody about this, then I'm going to kill you. Verses 8 and 9. When the Chaldeans burned the king's house, that's that's uh, that's the big, nice palace in Jerusalem and the houses of the people with fire and they broke down the walls of Jerusalem. They burnt the temple as well, by the way. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried away captive to Babylon the remnant of the people who remained in the city and those who defected to him with the rest of the people who remained. And also, as God prophesied, that filled up the entire Kidron Valley, not the Kidron Valley, but the, the valley south of Jerusalem with bodies. To the point where nobody could walk through it without stepping on bodies. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah the poor people who had nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him and look after him, and do not harm him, but do to him just as he says to him. Now you don't suppose that old Daniel, who is in Babylon and who's getting along pretty good with Nebuchadnezzar had put a word in Nebuchadnezzar's ear and said when you go back find Jeremiah and take good care of him don't kill him and set him free I don't know I think he got a good word about Jeremiah from somewhere don't you Verses 13 and 14. So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, sent Nebuchadnezzar, uh, all of these uh, chief officers of, of the king of Babylon. Then they sent someone to take Jeremiah from the court of the prison. Okay, they took him out of the prison and committed him to Jedaliah, the son of Ahak Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, that he should take him home. So he dwelt among the people. Okay, so they let him out of the prison. Meanwhile, the Lord, word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison. Okay, so before they even came and got him, the word of the Lord spoke to Jeremiah and told him, it says, go and speak to Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian. Remember Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, who, who was the one who took him out of the dungeon and saved his life, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring my words upon this city for adversity, not for good. They shall be performed in that day before you. Verses 17 and 18. But I will deliver you in that day, says the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men who you are afraid. For I shall deliver you and you shall not fall by the sword but your life shall be as a prize to you because you have put your trust in me, says the Lord. So Jeremiah is given his freedom and, uh, and there's still more about Jeremiah that we're going to see come up and as, as we go. And, uh, and so be patient there. And uh, I'll see you guys next week, uh, same time, same place. Uh, it's uh, it's getting pretty exciting now as, as the story's coming to a close. Uh, let's close in prayer. Father, we praise your name. Lord, uh, these are chilling words. As, as we read the story, it's, it's, uh, it's like a, a terrible novel in, in the way it reads, Lord, but 
we realize that it's 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 your judgment against sin, Lord. It's 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 how terrible the the judgment against sin will be, and and for each and every one of us who who refuses to repent of our sins and and to believe in in you and the salvation that you've provided for us, Lord, and and to trust in that, Lord, then we face that that terrible that terrible judgment against sin. And, and Lord, we, we're foolish to not repent and turn away from our sin and to walk in righteous ways according to your will in this life, Lord, and to, and to believe in you. It's, it's foolishness to not do that, Lord, and, and, to, and to turn away from the things that we know are wrong because, Lord, we, we know that the punishment is terrible. And it's horrible and, and something that we do not want to face. And it's inevitable, inevitable and unescapable. Lord, we ask that you would, that you would guide our hearts as we resubmit ourselves to you. Uh, show us the way to go, Lord, in these times that are becoming increasingly uh, fearful. And as we are afraid to go out of our own, houses it seems at times uh lord but help us to do your will at all times to speak the truth and love of your word at every opportunity and to be courageous lord knowing that that our hand our lives are in your loving hands and that you will take care of us and that you have power over all things in heaven and on earth lord guide our hearts and our minds and our lives Show us the ways that you would have us to go, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All righty. We'll see you guys again next week. Bye-bye.